Okay, um, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming um, and logging on this afternoon. We are lucky to be joined by Richard Silver, who is the senior partner at Silver Shemmings Ash. And his hot topic this month is on contract formation. Um, as always, if you could save your questions on the end, uh, to the end of the session, um, you can submit them via the Q&A panel, which is in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen, and which will happily answer them for you at the end of the session. So without any further ado, uh, Richard, it's over to you. Good afternoon, all. Uh, today, we're going to talk about contract formation. Uh, in my mind, I think it's the most important factor when dealing with construction contracts. Um, and I suppose the best place to start is to discuss what is the purpose of a contract. Um, it's unfortunate um, I'm not in front of all of you where I can actually ask you your comments, but the ones I generally get back are, it's something we look at when everything else has gone wrong. Um, but the reality is that contract is much wider than that. It does, in effect, two things. It allocates risk and it sets out procedures. And therefore, when choosing a particular contract, you want to choose the contract that has the best risk allocation and that it sets down all the necessary procedures that are likely to apply. So if I go straight away maybe to a JCT, we have a whole suite of JCT contracts. And the reason for that is they're all used for different purposes and with different risks. And it's pointless using a JCT minor works contract when you're building a 30 million pound high rise block of flats, because it's simply not suitable. It doesn't have all the procedures in place that may arise under that contract. If you want design, the contract should provide for design. If you want a certain mechanism for payment, the contract needs to deal with that. If you want sectional completion or partial possession, it needs to deal with that. The more procedures that you require, the more clauses that you need. And I'd go a step further. All these contracts are standard forms. They haven't been drafted for your specific requirement or for your specific purpose. And therefore it is most common to amend them because indeed, in my view, if you don't, it's likely they are not gonna suit the purpose for which you wish to put them to. That's why 99% of the time when you get a contract, there is a whole schedule of amendments. The problem is, is the majority of amendments that are in place are to change the risk. And it's my experience that generally when there is an amendment to the risk, it's normally in the employer's favor. Very rarely do I see an employer amending the contract because they think it is too risky for the contractor. It is in my experience, the opposite. So most amendments are to the risk but they should also consider the procedures that apply, particularly to the contract. And to give you an example of that, I've been involved in many, many school projects. Um, they're normally carried out in school holidays and the works usually have to be completed by something like the 5th of September when all the children return to school. And it may be the case that you need to sequence the works and you need to put in procedures how those sequencing are gonna work and that someone's gonna start in one particular room and then when they finish that room, they go to another room. Most contracts aren't drafted to that specific nature and therefore they need to be amended to meet that particular requirement. Another thing is to look at certain procedures, for example, in programming. There is a huge difference between engineering contracts, for example, the NEC, and traditional building contracts, for example, the JCT. If you look at the NEC, the provisions in there for programming and planning are extensive with requirements for an initial accepted program. And then they detail what an accepted program is with critical path analysis, labor histograms, and many other information. And then they set down what needs to be done updating that 
at least every month and quite often if the, the clauses were properly followed, potentially every day. If you then look at the JCT stand form, it says the contractor shall issue one project programme, full stop, no more. It doesn't say when it's meant to be revised, how much more information there is, when it needs to be updated or anything. And I do think that's one of the shortcomings of the JCT. And it's my view, those amendments need to be incorporated. Um, just on that, um, I do know that I'm doing a course on the RICS quick uh, prompt there on programming and planning, I think in a couple of weeks time. And I will cover the shortcomings with regards to programming and planning. Um, dealing with these different contracts, so they can have different procedures and different allocations of risk. So let's give one prime example. Exceptionally adverse weather conditions, or some people may remember it if you're somewhat of mature years, inclement weather. Under the JCT, exceptionally adverse weather conditions is what is called a neutral event. It is an event which entitles a contractor to an extension of time if they've been delayed, but not to the recovery of loss and expense. So both parties take part of the risk. If you then look at the NEC by way of example, it also includes provisions for exceptionally adverse weather conditions and provides that it is a compensation event. Being a compensation event, the contractor is entitled not only to extensions of time, but also its costs. So it's a very different situation to which you would find yourself under a JCT contract. If one then looks at the GC Works forms of contract, which are a government contract, they don't have provisions for exceptionally adverse weather conditions. And as a consequence, the contractor gets nothing. So there's a huge difference in exactly the same situation under different contracts. Under JCT, time, no money. Under NEC, time and money. GC Works, nothing. You can therefore see the significance of the contract. Now, it's all very well saying the significance of the contract, but the first thing you need to establish if there is actually a contract in place. Um, it will surprise you, possibly, that I would suggest that probably on 10% of construction contracts, there may not be any contract in place. It is one of the areas I find very problematic it is something that I don't think people pay sufficient regard to. So let's start off. In order to have a contract, you need to have basically four essential elements. Offer, acceptance, consideration, and intention to create legal relationships. Now I'm just gonna to go to the fourth one because it is not generally applicable in construction projects. And what is required for intention to create legal relationships is that at the time the parties enter into contract, they intended it to be a legal relationship as opposed to a social relationship. And a good example of this is people who have entered into pools, leagues or um, lottery syndicates. And where the people are all friends or relatives, the law presumes that they were not entering into a legal relationship. The reasoning for that is that if you were to ask these people at the time, what would happen if your two brothers you've entered into wouldn't pay you your share of a lottery win, your response would be, well, I never anticipated that would happen. I never considered this a legal relationship where I would need to rely upon the law because I just assumed they would pay me. It's that reason that quite often, if you're going to enter into a lottery syndicate, to have a written agreement between all those involved. I'm now going to cover offer, acceptance and consideration. Offer is fairly simple. Uh, when we're in construction, it's generally the offer of a tender. And once a tender is offered, the other party has the opportunity to accept that offer. 
I've got there at the bottom, it needs to be distinguished between an invitation to treat. In construction, we offer, often send out letters inviting contractors to tender. That is an invitation to treat. But in other areas, let's say if you go to a shop and you see on the shelf um, an item that you've been looking to purchase for some time, but the shop owner by mistake has put the wrong price on and it is half the price it should be, is that an offer? And the answer is it isn't. It is an invitation to treat. When you pick up the item off the shelf and take it to the till, you are offering to buy it. The person then taking the money is accepting your offer, creating a contract. Um, there are some exceptions in this regard. Um, and one is there is the Carlyle versus uh, Carbolic Smoke Ball Company. What basically happened in that case was the smoke ball company produced a sort of coal that they said stopped certain diseases. I think it was influenza, if my memory serves me right. And a little old lady bought it, used it, and caught it. And as a consequence, sought to take action. They said that their offer, because it was an advert, was not an offer. The court said differently, and as a consequence, they were found liable and had to pay damages to the little old lady. You may find something more recent that is similar concerning Hoover and BA flights. Hoover had come up with this fantastic advertisement um, offering the purchase of their vacuum cleaners, let's say for 200 pounds. And if you bought them, you could get flights for up to 500 pounds. Now, someone obviously hadn't worked out their maths very well. And obviously this was gonna be a BISC loss making uh, venture. Many people bought the vacuum cleaners and claimed their flights and Hoover refused to pay up. It went to court and Hoover lost because they had made an offer to the world at large. How long does an offer last? Well, I suppose the easiest thing to start with is if I make a tender and I say it's open for three weeks, then it's open for three weeks. But if I haven't stated how long it is open, it is open for a reasonable period of time. Now I'm gonna use that term a number of times today, reasonableness. And it's often said to me, what does reasonable mean? And it is a difficult one because it would all depend upon the facts. If you're on a big project, it may be reasonable that your tender is open for six months. I suggest to you in majority of times, it might not be open for five years, but it should definitely be open more than five days. But basically it will be dependent upon the nature of the work, nature of the organizations, other circumstances. But if not otherwise stated, an offer will be open for a reasonable period of time. Now this does present certain problems. It's my understanding that quite often when tendering for works, Contractors go out, or at least their estimators go out, and seek tenders from a number of subcontractors. Those subcontractors then submit their tenders. The contractor uses those tenders in putting forward its own tender for the works. They then secure the work, go back to the subcontractors, often seeking further discounts, I add, and then seek to place an order. But what happens if the subcontractor has made a big mistake? They identify that they've underpriced. Well, they can quite clearly withdraw their tender any time prior to acceptance. Even if they say it's open for six weeks, they can still withdraw it because it is not a contract. It is purely a tender. The only way of getting around this is if you actually ask subcontractors to tender and that you will pay them an amount of money to keep their tenders open for a set period of time. So in effect, you have created a contract with the subcontractors for them to keep their tenders open for a set period of time, and hence they cannot withdraw them. 
Were they to withdraw them, contrary to those terms, they would be in breach and you would be entitled to damages. Rejection or counteroffer. I think it's right to start off with what is often called the battling of the forms. It's been, I've got to work it out now, probably some 35 years, if not longer, from when I first started uh, on site in construction as a quantity surveyor, including placing orders with subcontractors. And what happened is we would go out for an invitation to tender. We would state that the terms would be X, Y, and Z, and what we wanted the subcontractor to price. Without foul, the subcontractor would come back and they would quote on something completely different. At the very least, they would say their terms and conditions would apply. Worst of all were lift companies, piling companies. You can never get them to agree anything but their own terms. But the point is, is that I've asked you to price for something based upon certain terms. The other party has then priced on different terms. I then place a subcontract order. It says across the top, subcontract order. And it says something like the following. I confirm my acceptance of your tender subject to my terms and conditions. That's not a subcontract order. That is a counter offer. And the effect of a counter offer is to reject the previous offer. In other words, that previous offer can no longer be accepted. It has come to an end. Obviously, a rejection also brings a previous offer to end, but it's that counter offer that is so important when we're dealing with construction projects. Because it is my experience, very rarely does the tenderer and the person who is seeking the tenders agree on the same terms. And this creates lots of problems, not least establishing what the contract is. And I will deal with this when I come to acceptance in a moment. Um, we've just got a couple of cases there concerning um, the contracts um, being open for a reasonable period of time and just pointing out that where death occurs, generally um, the offer isn't open any longer. Which turns us to acceptance. Uh, and the important thing is, is that acceptance can take the form of written word, written word, written in a contract where you signed it. It can be oral or acceptance can be by the nature of your conduct. It should remember that all of you are entering into contracts probably every day. If you go and buy a sandwich for lunch, you don't sign anything. Someone picks up the sandwich, you take it to the till, you've made an offer. The person accepts your money, that's the consideration which we'll deal with in the moment, and you walk away and a contract has been formed. There's nothing written, but there will be common law rights and statutory rights that are applicable. And if, for example, you find something in there that you would have preferred not to have found, there's likely to have been a breach by the person selling that sandwich. And you may have rights of redress, including damages. What we're identifying is not all contracts are in, the, in written form. And establishing the contract, we need to find that there is acceptance. Now, clearly, if we've sent out a contract and the other party has signed it and returned it, they have written through writing, confirmed their acceptance, there is a contract. What happens if they write back accepting it, signing at the bottom, but next to it they put subject to our terms and conditions? That's a counteroffer again. They haven't accepted it. Even they've used the word acceptance, they haven't accepted it. As I've put there, the acceptance must exactly fit the offer. Whatever you have offered, the other person must accept it exactly as you've offered it. I've dealt with that case because one of the biggest problems is quite often the parties have actually reached an agreement. 
One party is offered, the other party has accepted that, and one would think there is a contract. But there can only be a contract if there is sufficient certainty. I can only enforce something if somebody understands it. The judge has got to understand what the parties entered into. Now, it may be the case that certain clauses have not been put down. We haven't agreed the price. Price would be a reasonable amount. We haven't said how long we're going to carry it out. A reasonable period of time. But if we haven't identified the clear scope of works and what a party is actually to do, that creates a problem because we can't say they've got to do a reasonable amount. Well, no, they've got to do whatever is agreed. So I have seen contracts where the works are so uncertain that there is no contract. As we've identified, <clears throat> acceptance can occur by conduct. And I would suggest to you that that is quite often the case in construction contracts. How many of your contracts are actually signed by the person you've offered the contract to? I could ask an even easier question. How many of your contracts are issued before the other party has actually started on site? All too often works start without a contract in place, possibly with the issue of a letter of intent, which I will address a little later. But for there to be a contract, we need to see there's an acceptance. So I'm gonna give you an example. Let's just say that you're on a particular project and it's not going very well. You want to have a look to establish what your contractual entitlement is. So you get out the contract, only to find it's not signed. It's not been signed by the other party. You've sent out the contract, the other party has not signed it. You would say, well, they've been on site, they've been working, they must have accepted it by their conduct. Well, not necessarily because to be an acceptance, the offer must have been issued first. See, if you're going to be saying that by their conduct in starting their work, they must have issued the offer before. So you must have issued the contract before they've started. They're already on site when you've issued the contract. They can't have accepted by starting work because they've already started work and they're proceeding with the work. The next argument is to say, well, well, we issued the contract to them and they haven't come back to reject it. We know they were on site beforehand, but they haven't come back and said there's anything wrong with that. Well, I've sent each and every one of you a letter saying that if you watch this seminar, you each owe me £100. The reality is, you have no obligation because silence is never acceptance. So we need to look at what will be acceptance. So first of all, in starting works, following a contract having been issued or an offer being acceptance, by conduct you will have accepted. But equally it can be the other way around. The person who was starting the work could have sent an offer before starting on site and by you allowing them to work on site, you've accepted. I know a subcontractor who used to do that. What they would do was every Friday at five o'clock, before them due to start on Monday, they would go down to site to check to see if everything was okay. They'd go right at the end of the day. At the end of the day, they would then issue back the subcontract signed, but at the bottom of it saying, subject to our terms and conditions. And then they would start on Monday, arguing that you had our offer on Friday evening, you've now allowed us to start on Monday morning, you've accepted. So, number one is you need to see what was the offer and what was the acceptance. Any counter offer will cancel out the previous offer. So if there was a whole series of offers, none of which were accepted, but someone started on site, it will be the last offer issued prior to the person starting on site. 
However, if there was no offers in that both parties were rejecting their other, the others and there was ongoing negotiation, it is perfectly possible that despite work starting on site, there was no contract. I should add, there are other ways through conduct that you can have acceptance. I'll give you an example. Someone has sent you, you've started on site today, and the contract is sent out a week's time. The job then progresses. You haven't done anything different, so you haven't accepted their contract. But then you suddenly start issuing notices for extensions of time, quoting clauses in the contract that's been sent. By your action, you are likely to have accepted. You've submitted applications for payment and quoted clause numbers. Again, it is possible by your conduct you have accepted. So what we're identifying is that certain actions unintentionally can be considered acceptance by conduct. Consideration, one of my favorite quotes here, considerations must be sufficient but need not be adequate. I always refer to this case, um, husband and wife, um, not getting on too well, husband goes off with much younger um, lady friend. This is an actual case. Um, the husband is enjoying himself with his new partner, so he writes to his wife and says, darling, for the good old times, would you do me a favour? Would you sell me my car for me? You've got in the drawer all the papers, would you sell it? And obviously the wife, looking back to the good old times, says, of course I will. So she sold it for him and sent him the proceeds, a pound. That's what she sold it for, a pound. Was that contract enforceable? The answer is yes. The consideration was sufficient. It was something, but it may not be adequate. The fact that you have not entered in a, into a fair bargain is irrelevant. You enter into a poor bargain, hard luck. And I would suggest most construction contracts are poor bargains. All too often, when you've won the job, it's because you've possibly underpriced it but you cannot get out of it. Provided there is consideration, then it is good consideration. An example of that is a peppercorn. They have said a peppercorn is sufficient consideration. Quite often in contracts, you use a stamp. The reason for that is you put a stamp on that stamp. That's the consideration. It's something of value. Both parties provide consideration. In a building contract, the person who is undertaking the work is doing consideration in undertaking those works. They're making the other party better off. They themselves are worse off in that they're having to expend their energy and resources in carrying out those works. The other party is worse off because they've got to pay money and they're making the other party better off by giving them money. That is consideration. Both parties provide consideration. There is no need for that consideration to be adequate, to be fair. Consideration generally will not be in relation to previous acts. If I've already done something and then I ask for money to enter into contract with you, generally that will not be con good consideration. However, that is slightly different in certain construction contracts. If I ask you to start something under a letter of intent, and then subsequently we enter into a contract, quite often that contract has retrospective effect. It effectively encompasses the work that's been carried out prior to the contract having been entered into. And that is quite common in construction contracts. Indeed, it is not unusual for people to sign contracts and automatically putting themselves in breach in that they haven't followed the express terms of the contract. So do be careful there. Where you are signing contracts after the start date, 
make sure that you are not signing up something that you would prefer not to. Consideration should not be a duty which exists currently. This has something particular in construction contracts. Um, I'm an adjudicator and I get involved in many disputes concerning final accounts. And the contractor or the subcontractor has a whole file of AIs, CVIs, instructions. And every one of them has been valued. But it may be the case they have no entitlement. Because if those instructions just confirm what's already obliged to be carried out under the contract, the contractor has no entitlement because the existing obligation already arises. So if I already have to do something, then generally I'm not entitled to be paid for it again. We are going to deal with a couple of exceptions in a moment. Just on consideration, there must be some form of connection between a promise and the consideration offered to support the promise. It mustn't be completely unaffected by each other. Um, just to show you the value of consideration, if I choose not to sue you, provided I have some case, then that has been considered to be good consideration. Privity of contract. It has been slightly um, reduced by the Third Parties Rights Act, but the general principle is, is that those parties who enter into that contract are the only ones who can enforce it. To give you an example, I say I will give your friend five pounds if you paint my wall. If, for whatever reason, you paint my wall, the friend cannot enforce that contract. Only you can enforce that contract because the contract is between you and I. This does have an effect in construction contracts because unfortunately, all too often, the parties do not enter into contracts with the entity that they thought. I've seen many contracts where the parties are negotiating they then sign the contracts but don't look too clearly and one party then finds out the other one is an SPV with no money. Um, they want to go after the original people that they thought they were entering in contract but because there is no privacy, they can't. From the case or the example I just gave you, um, the consideration does not necessarily have to move to the two parties. I can offer to do something for someone else in return for you to pay me if you so agree. Just going back to that, pre-existing duties. Um, when I've been on construction projects, it's not uncommon for jobs to not go very well. And for example, um, I've placed an order with you as a carpenter to carry out certain works and by a certain completion date. And if you fail to complete by that completion date, there are damages that exist. In other words, if you fail to complete on time, you are liable for damages. The problem is, is that under my own contract with the employer, I'm going to be liable for even greater damages. And as a consequence, I go to you and say, look, I'd like you to complete on time. And if you do, I'll pay you a bonus. So you put additional resources in and lo and behold, manage to complete on time. And then I say, well, I'm not paying you a bonus because it is a pre-existing duty. You already had to complete on time. You've done nothing more. You have provided no consideration and hence the agreement, if there was one, is unenforceable. And that's the exact thing that roughly happens with Williams versus Roffey. And there was found to be a contract in place because put simply, the other party did not have to complete on time because 
if they would not have done, they would have been liable for damages. That's what the contract provided. By accelerating, it's very possible they may have spent more money in completing than they would have been liable. They've done something additional and hence they've provided consideration and a contract was formed. Another example of good consideration is the payment of something early. I owe you £5,000, which I am due to pay you in a week's time. You come to me and say, can you pay it today? To which I say, no. You say, well, pay it today, I'll accept half. I say, okay, and I pay you. There is then a contract and you cannot go back because there has been consideration. There is, however, a slightly separate case, which is at the bottom, DNC Builders versus Rees. By all account, Rees was not a very nice lady. She owed a certain amount to the builders and said to them, I have no intention to pay you a penny. However, I know that you are in desperate need for cash and indeed may even go insolvent. So what I'm willing to do is I'm willing to pay you 500 pounds, but on the basis of it being full and final settlement. The builders had little choice, so they took the money. The question then was, was there an agreement in place to prevent them recovering the other monies owed? And the court said, yes, they could recover it because Mrs. Rees had not provided any consideration. She had not paid the contractor early, she had done nothing additional. She'd only paid them what they were properly due. As a consequence, there was no consideration and no contract and they could recover the remaining monies. Now we've dealt with contracts, but I am aware all too often projects start without a contract being in place. Quite often, it's because a letter of intent has been issued. Letters of intent are issued for loads of different reasons. It may be the case because of the time it takes to put a contract in place, you just haven't got the time. You want them to start tomorrow, but it's gonna take a week or two weeks just to get the paperwork all put together and sent out. So we send a letter of intent. It may be that we're still in negotiation. And as a consequence, we think for a good reason that it would be worthwhile sending out a letter of intent. It may be because we've been placed with a letter of intent and therefore we don't want to place a contract with someone else. So we send a letter of intent. So there are various reasons why letters of intent are issued. Question is, what are they? Are they a contract? Are they worthless? Are they something else? Are they an offer, an acceptance? What are they? And it all depends upon their content. Different letters of intent have different content. But what I've identified is three nature of common clauses. The first is often a cap in that letter of intent. For example, it says, it's our intention to enter into contract with you. Please commence works on site, but subject to carrying up to the works to a value of 300,000 pounds. Now, if the tender wasn't 300,000 pounds, it was a far greater sum, then we've limited what the contract can undertake. They cannot complete all the works as their offer. They can carry out a much smaller scope of works up to that cap. It may be that you price to build a building and they say, please carry out the initial enabling works. Again, it's not for the whole scope of works. It's limited by what amount of works are to be carried out. It may be limited to a period of time. We'd like you to carry out the works for the next month. Now the original contract duration was a year. But all they're saying is to start the initial works up to a month. So there could be three possible caps time, money, or duration. 
As I've identified, quite often letters of intent are issued because something has yet to be agreed. So the letter of intent will confirm that. We are still in negotiations over the terms and conditions. The former contract will be the JCT standard form, but the following matters still need to be agreed. What I also find quite often at the end of letters of intent is it says something like this. If we choose not to enter into contract with you, we can without notice terminate this letter of intent and you shall only be entitled to your reasonable costs. If, however, we do subsequently enter into a, to a contract, it shall have retrospective effect and it shall be deemed that all the works that you have undertaken are under this future contract. Now, put very simply, if a letter of intent includes any of these examples, then it is not a contract because there has not been an offer and acceptance. We've identified that the offer must exactly match the acceptance. It hasn't, particularly on the second example, because it actually says we haven't agreed. How can you have an offer and acceptance and agreement if you haven't reached an agreement? It's not possible. So if there are still important factors to be agreed, then there is no contract. You don't have to agree, for example, a completion date. But if you say it is our intention into a contract with an agreed completion date, but we haven't agreed that, there is still a matter to be agreed. So if there's any term that is significant and has not been agreed, there is no contract. If we have the last one, we've actually identified there's no contract. We've said we can bring this current contract to an end immediately. Well, that's not what you can do under a standard contract. And it says that we will pay you quantum merit, a reasonable amount. Well, that's not what the standard contract says. So quite clearly, we're under something else. So with all of those three examples, there is no contract. So if there is no contract, does that mean you have no entitlement? Where you have a letter of intent that follows what I've just put, there is no contract. In that there is no contract, there is no completion date. It can't be a completion date because we haven't agreed what you're going to carry out. We haven't got the ability to complete all the works because there is a cap. If there is no completion date, there is no liquidated damages. And in view, there is no liquidated damages or completion date and time is effectively at large, then there's no provisions for extensions of time either. What's more, in that there is no contract, there is possibly no obligation to complete the works. And what the party who is undertaking the works is not bound to their tender, but is entitled to quantum merit, a reasonable amount. Now, I've had two situations that come to mind that deal with this. Quite a few years ago, I was asked to go down to a site near King's Cross where certain enabling works were being undertaken. I was asked to produce an extension of time and a claim for loss and expense because the contractor was identifying they were losing a lot of money. And for those of you who have ever dealt with me, my first question is always the same. Please, may I see the contract? They said, we haven't got the contract yet. We've got a letter of intent. Okay, that's interesting. What had happened was because this was King's Cross, there had been an old factory there and therefore there was very heavy contamination. In the tender, they had priced that contamination, but what they'd priced was woefully undervalued. And as a consequence, they were losing a fortune. Furthermore, because it was taking so much longer, they were way, way behind. 
But the issue is, is they had not signed the contract because there were still a few things to be agreed. Indeed, if my memory serves me right, the other party couldn't place the contract because they needed to get certain authorization internally. So I advised the client in the first instance, you don't need an extension of time, you don't need a loss in expense. And indeed, if you choose to, you can walk off this site tomorrow and you can recover quantum merit. They were, to say the least, very surprised. I explained it to them and to be honest, it took quite a long time to persuade them that this was the right answer. Because everybody, when they're on a particular project, just deems that they are in contract. But where you have a letter of intent, that is quite often not the case. Now, I would ask, but it won't be very um, effective for everybody to put up their hands who are working on a project with no contract being in place. And I would imagine that at least 10 to 15% of you would do it. Yet, whilst you're doing that, you are under a letter of intent. I'd also ask how many of you are, when submitting interim applications for payment, asking for quantum merit? What more often that happens is that people simply look at their bill rates, their pricing document, and claim under that. Well, that's not your entitlement. Your entitlement is to quantum merit, a reasonable amount. My experience says is if I'm given a choice between what my estimator has priced and a reasonable amount, I think I'll go for reasonable amount. The amount of jobs I've been involved in where someone tells me they've allowed for a quarter of a quantity surveyor, where you find a quarter of a quantity so I've got no idea, but um, my experience is that prelims are generally underpriced. And indeed I was told that if I was a good QS, I should be able to at least cover my cost by claiming extra monies to get back the additional three quarters. But the point is, is that if you are under a letter of intent, generally you are in a much stronger position than you are in under a contract. You have, no potential liability for late completion of damages. You are entitled to quantum merit. So therefore the question arises, why ever enter into a contract if you can avoid it? Generally, the reason people enter into contracts is first of all, to secure the work. If you're given the contract, you know you'll be given the opportunity to complete it. Number two, it is possible that the contract terms put you in a better position, but I do question that. The third thing is that it does create certainty and quite often there may be commercial pressure placed upon you to enter into an agreement. But I would suggest to you that quite often it's actually better to stay under a letter of intent. And indeed, I have worked with many organisations where I have just done that. What I do is, is I write to the other party saying that we are extremely frustrated that there is no contract in place. Because it's my experience, reverse psychology always works. Tell them you something you want and then they're more likely to say no. I then say we would be very keen to enter into a contract. However, we do recognize that there are some issues that we will need to agree in order to place this contract in place. Mindful that we've been on site for a long time. And then I will pull all the clauses apart to say why they need to be amended and do not reflect the situation that now stands. And then seek to avoid entering into that contract because I believe more often than not, you will be better off. Now I did mention that there were two examples I was involved in with letters of intent. The second one was again a project in London. It was a new build block of flats um, above um, a number of shops and commercial areas, which was in itself above an existing tube line. And what had happened was that the works had started to progress, but there was a major problem in that the contractor needed to get approval to progress the works from London Underground and they need to be put in place track monitoring and the whole process had to be approved. The works had been on site for a year. 
There was a crash deck in place. There was track monitoring in place, but no works had been commenced because LUL had not yet provided its approval. With all the site team working, waiting, all the subcontractors looking to start and could not. A major concern to the contractor. They called me to claim for an extension of time because what they said was there was a major problem because this was a design and build project and in the employee's requirements there was an express clause that said the approval of track monitoring from LUL was to be a responsibility of the contractor and they would be entitled to no extensions of time. So I went down to site and they said to me, Richard, could you produce a extension of time and loss and expense claim? I said, of course. And as was always the case and is always the case, I asked in the first instance, could I see a copy of the contract? And they said, yes, that's lucky. We signed it yesterday. Here's a copy. I had to give them the bad news. Had they called me two days before, before they signed the contract, they were not in contract. That clause would not kick in. They would have been entitled to quantum merit. They had no liability for damages. And if they wanted to, they could have pulled off. Because they had, and always do, signed contracts, they were now bound by those terms of contract. And unfortunately, despite my best efforts, they were not entitled to an extension of time in relation to the non-approval of LUL because the contract was clear. It was the contractor's problem. What I've identified is the importance of ensuring that you know what the contract is. What have you entered into? What are its terms? Because it can have a substantial impact. So letters of intent, if there is no contract, it is actually an area of property law, quasi contract and restitution. Basic situation is if I've asked you to do something, it is unfair if you then do it and I have no liability. And as a consequence, what I have to do is to pay you a reasonable amount, quantum merit. So far as what is quantum merit, what is a reasonable amount, it will depend. It is what is a fair market price and can be, provided you've shown you've gone out for the right tenders and the like, cost plus. Generally, I would suggest it would be very nice to be on a contract where you are to be paid cost plus. Okay, so in summary, it is my experience that quite often contracts are not put in place. But if they are, the contract should set down the risks and procedures. It will set down who takes the risk for time. If I have a completion date with damages, the contractor's taking the risk if the job goes on. If I go on a complete cost plus contract, the employer's taking the risk of price. If I'm going on a design and build, the contractor's taking on the design. So the contract will set out the risk and it should also set down what are the procedures to apply. Where your contract is silent on the procedures, you will generally fall back on the common law. By way of example, the wagon mound, which is a particular case which applies to reasonableness. If you're in the situation of trying to establish if there's a contract in place and you haven't got a signed contract, it will always be the last offer before acceptance. So you need to establish what the acceptance is and then find what was the last offer before that. Any offer that goes in between your alleged offer and the acceptance will represent a counter offer which will be a rejection of the previous offer. So you need to go through the whole process, document after document to establish what the last offer is and what constitutes acceptance. It is possible that there is no agreement because there is no acceptance and hence a party is entitled to quantum merit. 
Okay. Any questions? We have indeed got some questions. Um, someone here is asking, in the case of adverse weather conditions, under the NEC form of contract, would insurance cover apply to adverse weather conditions leading to stoppages, compensation to the contractor, as potentially an act of God situation? Okay. Um, act of God, false majeure, is um, a much spoken um, issue at the moment, not least because of the corona virus. Um, force majeure is a French term and is not defined in any contract. But it's basically something that the parties are unaware of and they have no control of. Weather wouldn't generally fall into that situation. And it particularly would not fall into that situ situation where you have an express clause for exceptionally adverse weather conditions. So it's actually identifying that it doesn't fall into that area. So false majeure will be generally something that the parties cannot foresee and is neither party's response. Um, hopefully that's the question. I'm not quite sure what was meant by the insurance point, but um, basically on NEC, we've got exceptionally adverse weather conditions. If there was a clause for false majeure, it would not cover adverse weather conditions. I should just simply, uh, uh, did, Julie, did they mention inclement weather? Uh, no, just uh, adverse weather. I won't do it. Okay, fine. Next question. Okay. In relation to offer durations, if after the tender period, a tender is told that they are the preferred contractor and that the client wishes to enter into contract with them, is that considered an acceptance and therefore the duration of the offer no longer applies even if the contract is not yet entered into? Um, the question is a simple one, but applying it is much more difficult. What you need to determine is, is has there been an acceptance? Is there anything left to be agreed? So if I submit to you a tender and in the invitation to treat, I have put down that the term of contract shall be a JCT design and build 2021, et cetera, et cetera. I put all the information in it. You then submit your tender on a form which simply says, put the value in and sign it and you put it in. If I then say to you, it is our intention to accept your tender, we shall send out the contract documents for your due signature, I've accepted. You're already in contract. I don't have to send all the contract documents for you to sign. It, it obviously exists, assists, but I don't have to. So provided by my initial letter, I've come back to you and in, in effect stated that I accept your tender, then the contract is placed and that is it you would need to establish and show that you have accepted. Now, I already raised the issue of letters of intent. I've seen letters of acceptance, letters of approval, um, loads of different letters, and each letter look, needs to look at their terms. It doesn't matter what it's called, it is what is its content. Is it an acceptance or is it not an acceptance? Right. Okay. Um... Another question, hi, does a surety contract require consideration? Does a surety contract? All contracts require, as far as I'm aware, consideration in one format or another. Yes. Right. And when there is a cap on an LOI, is there still a contract up to that amount? No. Let's deal with letters of intent a bit more detail. Um, if I ask you to price a whole job, but I say that I'm going to break it down into four part projects or four sections, and I say the initial demolition works, followed by the groundworks, followed by the superstructure, followed by the roof, and I place an agreement with you for a fixed sum and a duration for each element, then that is a contract. But where you have priced for the whole job and I am giving you a letter of intent for a lesser or smaller value 
or content of work, then it is not a contract. It is a um, quasi-contract and restitution. Um, because there is nothing fixed to, for example, what work's going to be carried out. If I say you're going to carry out to £500,000, how much of that is prelims? No, I don't guarantee you'll be able to keep it because I can withdraw it at any time. So it is not a contract, no. I know everybody thinks it is, but it's not. There are some further ramifications on that. Where I have given you a letter of intent up to £500,000, but I ask you to carry on and you do £700,000, you'll be pleased to, to, to know you're still only entitled to £500,000. Um, unless I, by my conduct, show that you are not capped by that amount, you are capped. So there are two ways I can show that you are to be paid beyond the 500,000. The first is by writing to you and stating that the cap has been increased to 1 million. Or the second is by my conduct showing I've waived my rights, for example, by paying you one pound over the cap. I'm therefore showing that the cap is no longer relevant and therefore it is no longer applicable. But what I would say to you is be very careful. I have seen many cases where an employer has put a cap to £500,000. They've kept issued instructions, loads of additional works. The contractor carries on carrying out the works. There's then a dispute as to the value. And then out of the hat, the employer says, by the way, you're not entitled to any more because there's a cap of £500,000. So be careful. All right. NEC contracts, where the agreed contract has been issued to the subcontractor, but the subcontractor has not yet signed it, can the party alter the order at no cost? Right, I am guessing that hopefully this is what's being said. Um, a party submits a quotation. The other party intends to place a contract with them and sends a contract out. The other party then doesn't sign the contract and therefore the paying party now says, actually, I think I want to change this order altogether. The answer to it is a very simple one. Has a contract been formed? So let's give you two examples, probably three examples here. We've gone out, we've said to the subcontractor, we would like you to price on NEC form of contract in this form. Subcontractor comes back and says, I've priced on something completely different. You then send the NEC form out. They don't sign it. There's no contract. If that's right and there's been no agreement, you can do what you like. You can chuck them up. If, however, by way of example, you've said to them, we would like you to price on NEC. They've priced on NEC. You've sent, sent out an NEC contract, but they've not signed. You've accepted. You've placed the contract. They don't need to sign. There is in any event a contract in place and they are bound. Okay. In awarding uh, expenditures of time and loss and expense of JCT, can you award time by X amount of weeks to close the gap between contract PC date and actual completion date? but then award loss and expense for a lesser amount of weeks due to your assessment of contractual entitlement? Um, I like to say simply yes and say <laughs> no. Um, but the answer is yes, because extensions of time and loss and expense under a JCT are not linked. The problem is that under JCT, we have relevant events and relevant matters. And certain of the events and certain of the matters are the same. And therefore, there is an instant, in many people's mind, link between the two. But they are not. If you look in JCT, they are different clauses. So the first thing is, let's just say by way of example, um, I'm on a job, it's a JCT form of contract, and I am delayed by six weeks because of exceptionally adverse weather conditions. Exceptionally adverse weather conditions, as everybody knows, under JCT entitles you to time and no money. However, I can still claim money. 
Because let's say there is late information issued in regards to brick pointing. This brick pointing is completely off the critical path. But because of this late information, I have all my scaffolding standing on the outside of the building doing nothing. It's got nothing to do with the weather. It's simply I can't progress this element of work. Is this a relevant matter? Yes, it is. So I can actually have loss and expense when there is no entitlement to extension of time or where there is an extension of time, but it is only exceptionally adverse weather conditions. Where there is an extension of time for, let's say, late instructions or variations, it is fairly rare that the contractor has incurred no loss. So it is possible that you could award an extension of time, but they've incurred no loss, but that would be a rare occurrence because occasionally they will have incurred a loss by reason of the event. Okay. How would you deal with payment for variation works under a letter of intent? There are no variations under a letter of intent because there is no scope of work. All of it is entitled to quantum merit. We're going back to the general mistaken view of thinking that we're bound, bound by the original scope. We're not. We have, depending upon what the letter of intent says, let's just say it says carry out the works up to £500,000. That's what we do. And if that's the original scope of works or variations, it all fills into the same pot and we're entitled to quantum merit. Okay. And contract by conduct or verbal are subject to law or jurisdiction of different countries? Say that one again. Contract by conduct or verbal um, contract, um, are they subject to, to the law or jurisdiction of different countries? Um, well, we're only dealing with UK law here. So if you were entering into a um, contract where there has been oral or conduct, then that's within the English jurisdiction. It wouldn't apply to any other jurisdiction. But there are other jurisdictions that have similar laws. Um, so it is possible that in lots of other countries where there is a acceptance through conduct, they will similarly be bound under those laws. But it will generally be where the work is carried out, which will dictate what jurisdiction you're in. So give you a prime example, if you carry out, you're a French company carrying out work for a German company in England, the English law will apply because the works is being carried out in England. They can't say we'll exclude the Construction Act because it's in England. They can't say we will exclude liabilities under English law. You can't do it. If you're carrying out the work in England, it will be the English law that will apply. And then um, final question that's come in, is there any way a letter of intent can form a contract? Yes, because the term letter of intent doesn't mean anything. It can be anything. If I say this is a letter of intent, but I accept the offer, it's a contract. So lots of people put, for example, it is our intention to enter into contract with you. In the meantime, we accept your offer, please start. That's acceptance. Yeah. I don't even have to send the contract or anything else. That has created a contract. So I think the problem is, is that there is a lot of consultants and contractors and other organization that have on their computer system a precedent of a letter of intent. And they pull it out and they use it every time. And quite often they're using the wrong form. So if you're in the situation where you want to place the contract with them, but it takes some time, simply say, we accept contract conditions for signature to follow. You're now in contract. Yeah, okay. Right, that's all of the questions that we've got this evening, Richard, so thank you. There were, there were quite a few there to get through, so um, thank you very much. Thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. Um, as always, if there's any specific issues that you would like to speak to Richard about or you have a specific issue um, in light of tonight's, uh, tonight's seminar, as you can see his email address, richardsilver at silverllp.com is there on the screen. 
and in your notes. Um, he will be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have for him. Um, so thank you everyone, stay safe, and thank you again, Richard, for your time. Thank you, everybody.